Well, while we're finishing out that scene, the voiceover begins for the next scene. And it says, I felt helpless. I guess it was a way to feel in control. And apparently this is a a support group for survivors of Gilead. June, Emily, Moira are there. The lamps! Oh my God, the lamps! Let's talk about the lamps! (laughs) They're everywhere! (laughs) I lost my friggin' mind when I saw these lamps. Okay, let me explain why these lamps were a big deal to us. Because in season three, when Marjorie was talking about the light theory thing, one of the key light theory things I remember her talking about was how in when June was in the basement reading the Red Center dossiers of all of her handmade friends and how she's surrounded by like a dozen freaking lights and it's lights with white lampshades and I, re- I remember you had said that they reminded you of bonnets. They reminded you of like white handmaid's bonnets so it was like they were looking over her as she was reading the files about them so she wasn't alone while she was going through this. And then we find out that maybe that wasn't necessarily a thing. And now all of a sudden, we get this episode that I watched ahead because I'm an impatient little shit. And I couldn't, I could not wait. So I watched it. And then here I am watching it like two weeks before the other two can watch it. And I'm just sitting there like, I can't even say anything about this. God damn it. This is why I shouldn't have watched ahead. (laughs) But these lamps, they looked like freaking handmade bonnets, and that had to be on purpose. Guys, was that on purpose? It has to be. It has to be. It's too perfect. And, you know, I'm going to probably take it to a much more, you know, subjective viewpoint with everything that I see here. But I feel like if nothing else, yes, the lights are meant to look like handmaids in the handmade support circle. That's it. We'll, that we'll I that's that I will double down on. That yes. that happened intentionally. Absolutely. Um, and they're scattered. I mean, it's not even like just in the handmade circle. They're like throughout the whole damn library and they're all over the place. It that was yes, I agree there. Uh but one of the things that was more prevalent through all of this light theory talk was that The artificial light is essentially Gilead and Gilead oversight of some sort versus natural light, which is more or less just like truth, right? And so, because there's just so much beautiful lighting and natural light. And I think I was just really trying to find more there than really just sometimes beautiful shots and ugly, terrible scenes and the juxtaposition of that. So, but here, they're also sitting in a circle, these refugees. And this is where I was like, oh, God, I can't keep doing circles and lights in the same scene, but we're going to go there because it's so perfect. So you have four little handmade lights. And if you think of it as Gilead, just even just symbolically Gilead, it they're just always there. It's it, They can't get rid of it. It's exactly what we just talked about. June cutting her hair isn't going to change anything. Gilead's still inside her. It's become part of her. All of that trauma is now part of her and it changes the way she acts every day and these is this is a circle of refugees so we were talking about how circles is more of a canadian thing she's trying to get out of the box and then all of a sudden on her trip to canada there's like circles everywhere and so they're sitting in a circle in the dark and all you see are these red handmade lamps and it's the same thing with the scene that we had seen in season three of they're red it's not it's not just that they're these lamps that look like the handmade angel wings but they actually are giving off this red tint to them so within the circle there's four very specific lamps making a box and i'm like wow even in canada you can't get out of the box like the circle in the box like they obviously don't fit together and these refugees they don't fit anywhere else like they have all this trauma and they're trying to move forward with their life in Canada but they can't because they've got this Gilead stuck within them and here it is right spelled out in lights and shapes for me so that is the end of light theory um for the most part but that one is as concise as I can explain it 
I did much better than I thought it would. So yeah, good job. Until the next scene, because don't worry, there's still more. But that's the mm-hmm. basic <laughs> gist of it. Uh, but also, I just love the shot because, first of all, let's talk about the fact that they're in a library. So that's like, hello, not Gilead. I love that. Uh-huh. Right. And it's a beautiful library with all of this natural light, but it's night. So all you get is the skyline. And it almost looks like those handmade lights extend forever because they are throughout the library as well. And then you just see like the skyline lights and it just looks like, you know, no matter where these women go in their day-to-day lives Gilead will be somewhere lurking and it's like what we were talking about with the PTSD like you never know what's going to trigger you and what's going to bring it out and give you some kind of response and interrupt you just trying to live and I think that's more or less what this entire episode is about absolutely Mm -hmm. um there is one other thing that I wanted to uh, point out with the lights as well is um, once I saw those bonnets, my f- I thought immediately went to perhaps these are meant to be like from a visual standpoint, memorial uh, memorials or totems to the handmaids that had passed or that weren't that weren't able to make it. So we're looking at. Well, at first I was like, oh, obviously Alma, Brianna. I was like, and Janine. I was like, but that's only three. Why are there four? And then I thought more on it, and I noticed that there was an empty chair as well. Um, So you have Sarah, Ellie, Alma, and Brianna. And then we also had June, Moira, and Janine. Those are our seven handmaids that were mentioned um, in season four, or the end of season four, episode three, Crossings, in that sort of like, when all seven of them, uh, all seven of them were uh, shown at the very end. Those are our seven core handmaids, like, of the names that we should remember. And we know Sarah, Ellie, Alma, and Brianna didn't make it. We have confirmation of this, that those four are dead. And I, like, looked at those, like, bonnet lights as, like, a sort of memorial to them. And the empty chair, I was like, that's Janine. That's our unanswered question. They don't know. So, like, for me, it was sort of them dangling, like, that, like, is she or isn't she moment uh, card like oh, I rabbit hole a little nice. bit about the, I rabbit hole like a little that. bit about the lights as well and like in yeah. like that slightly different way but like when I noticed that there was when I noticed that there was four lights there and not five I, like immediately I was like not immediately but like once I started to like go down that uh that tangent I was like Janine's still alive and they're gonna ra- they're gonna show it in this episode oh you're good ah oh. <laughs> It was, it, t- it took a second to like, like of looking at that and looking at those damned lights before like things started to kind of, kind of click. So. Awesome. So I hope that that's where they were going with the lights was they were trying to give us like some sort of like lighting theory hints like that, like we're not off base. I hope those were Easter eggs for us specifically. <laughs> Thank that would you. be yeah. super cool. <laughs> I took it as such. <laughs> and no one's going to tell me otherwise because I won't even ask. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I hope we have the opportunity to ask someday. We will. Anyway, um, I thought that the conversation that these uh, that um, these handmaids were having was really compelling as well, where they were talking about their coping mechanisms and um, how one of them was talking specifically about cutting. And Moira asked the question, like, didn't your commander notice? And she responded with, I cut high up on my arms, that way they wouldn't see it. And Moira brings up a good point of cutting as a way to cope, as a coping mechanism. And um, the girl, other girl that was talking talked about how, like, it gave her, like, some sort of sense of release. And this is a normal thing that you, uh, that you hear with people that, um, that do any sort of uh, self-mutilation or self-harm, um, is that it's something that they have control over. Um, so I thought that I really appreciated that they um, that they discussed this because invariably it's one has to imagine that this sort of behavior is rampant throughout these handmaids, but because they're not given an opportunity, they're in this horrific scenario. Um, they're fully alienated. They are. I mean, one ha- there's no focus on mental health whatsoever, which we really leaned in on in season three um, when we were talking about Eleanor. Um, and how else is one to cope beside, and like, also, one has to imagine that suicide rates are relatively high amongst handmaids, um, and cutting is a nat, or, um, is one of the steps of a natural, uh, to the natural progression of a suicide. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're suicidal, but it is. It's definitely a sign of mental distress and pain. So I appreciate that they were willing to have this conversation on the show about different signs of, uh, of how people cope with or don't cope with their uh, their state of mental duress. Interesting to see another side of 
coping and of the same trauma because these people have all more or less obviously everyone's situation is always going to be entirely unique but they all have a much more similar shared experience than most of the people that they're going to be interacting with on a day-to-day basis and it's coming right off of the ep- the scene where the first thing i wrote in my notes as june was cutting her hair was she's taking back control and so we've seen all the ways in which june copes with all of the traumas that she's experienced and it's interesting to cut right to the next scene where she's saying yeah I cut because it was a control it was a release and then she goes into all of it and it's like it was the first sign that we're seeing that throughout the rest of the episode we're going to see that June is coping differently than they are. It comes down to different coping mechanisms work for different people based off of any number of any number of factors um just like people can go through the exact same trauma but they're going to work through it in a de- any uh, any manner of ways, depending on what the, uh, what tools they already had in their mental health toolbox before going through the trauma, and what are uh, and what's going to work best for them. Um, in a case with June, um, when all of the uh, when all the other um, handmaids are or um, survivors of Gilead, rather they're not handmaids anymore. Uh, when all the other survivors of Gilead are discussing um, June facing Fred in the courtroom, and June says, I'm not nervous or worried or scared. I can't fucking wait. You can mm-hmm. just tell like that this is a different attitude than some of these other uh these other uh survivors might have. Um so it's it just kind of play it kind of plays into like her saying, like, you know, f- like later on when she and Moira are talking in the stacks, um, like I thought I'd have more in common with them and like, you know, mm-hmm. failings, forgiveness, journaling, like I don't, like you can tell it's not how she copes, and my mi- my big frustration here though is, yeah, you should feel that anger and like you should work through that, but her not understanding how that might be some other people's way of coping is effectively not giving them the space that they need to cope in the manner that's best mm-hmm. for them. Agreed. It also points a. Th- points to the fact that this type of coping stuff isn't adequate for June. No. I think that it's to the point where she's got she's had a very unique experience. Like I think that her experience has been an, an experience that some parts of it, the women in that group can understand because they most certainly lived it. But I don't think that they've had to deal with the shit that June has. I mean, like, there's just, there is this really, like, some next level fuckery with June's situation that I don't know if she feels like hearing these stories, if she feels like she really belongs here. If there was another woman in that group that was talking about some of the stuff that she has been through, maybe then that, like, and it was similar to June's, there's a possibility that June could be there with her and be like, oh, my God, my my person, you fucking get it. You know, oh, you went you went to the torture center too. Oh, you dealt specifically with Aunt Lydia too. Like I don't know, like something to make her feel like she belonged there. She doesn't feel like she belongs there right now. So, it kind of like it goes both ways. And then the other thing too is that this whole, a lot of this episode has been about people speaking up when they're feeling like they're ready to speak up or when they want to take the opportunity to speak up. And there's so many instances like. For example, in this group right now where she's talking, actually, she didn't even get a chance to talk. It was other people talking about her and her situation, and 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 she hadn't even really spoken about it yet. So it's almost like they weren't letting her speak about her own thing. So it's – she's just not feeling – this is not adequate for her. End of story. This, this whole experience is not adequate for her. I mean, actually, you know what? Let's just say that we're pretty sure that nobody else in that group has had the experience that she has because, like Moira said, she doesn't come with her own security de- – like, they don't come with their own security detail. Yeah, but she says it's even more than that, and I agree that it is. It's not just a, that – well, it. I think it's – I agree with you that she has – experiences that are entirely unique um, especially her refugee experiences but also hey how long has she really been there we can assume at least less than everyone else has right so she's a lot more fresh off the trauma yes and on top of that she what's the coolest thing to me is that I had said a some episode probably the last one that like she really needs more people around her that have gone through the same thing to kind of yeah 
get support from. And then I see it in this first ep- first scene and I'm like, oh, good. But then I'm like, oh, my gosh, by the end of it, I'm like, she doesn't even need the support from the group. The group needed her to lead them. And that's what I think is really interesting is because yeah. she does step right in there and say, okay, enough's enough. Like, like she steps into that leadership role of this group. Real quick. No problem. Like, yeah. this is June now. This is the June and what she's grown into. She kicks Moira out of that. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> I wouldn't say she steps into an open leadership position. She used No, she doesn't. Well, well, yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't think it was open, but she definitely doesn't care. Like, she's, she's looked at Moira the same way she looked at Steven. She just got less pushback of, I don't really care what you say. I'm going to just call the shots. And Steven's like, no, you're not. And Moira's like, what the hell is happening right now? But it was also interesting that they're coping. It's a, it's not working for them either. And I think that's the point that we see by the end of it is that, yes, Moira is saying a lot of things that I'm sure are entirely accurate and of course you shouldn't have the anger and all of that but also it almost minimizes their experience by saying they shouldn't have anger and june's like i'm angry and this is all fresh to me and i think the most unique thing of all of june's experience and the reason why she can kind of lead them to a different way of coping a way of releasing a different Mm -hmm. way of of healing and it's because she gets to face her abuser the face of her of all of her trauma in canada how many of them get that they have to find journaling Mm -hmm. and support groups because they come here and they're told first of all they're going to be surrounded by people who are not fresh off trauma and the first thing they're going to say is exactly the stuff that moira's saying of you need to let it go you need to learn to move on you need to find what freedom looks like for you find what this new life looks like but june's finding out that there is no new life the life that she had hoped was in canada isn't her best friend or husband and one of her child children are still there and none of it is looking like anything that she ever hoped it would be it doesn't feel good and she gets to go see fred and serena face to face and testify to confront all of it so it's just interesting that i think that's the most unique part of her experience is that she can confront and have anger and put it into an outlet that's helpful instead of cutting which would be mm-hmm. a harmful, you know what I mean? Like I get yeah, that they're right. both outlets, but at least June's outlet seems to make her feel better in the end. And it mm-hmm. seems to make Emily feel better too, but we'll get there. Yeah. Right. That's Which is probably also why she was so insistent upon pushing Emily towards who is this person? Why is this person? Um, which again, like you said, we'll get to. Um, I find it interesting your notion about uh, the how you brought up the trivializing of experiences. Um, because I think that like, inadvertently june and i am very much an angry person i would cope with this the same way that june would where it's just like oh no we confront it we talk about this we bring it on head on and you feel that anger and like you just you acknowledge it um but there's also an understanding that not everyone works like that some people need to have that peaceful release instead um so I understand where June is coming from with wanting to confront everything, uh, confront her anger and feel it, um, and wanting to help the other, uh, the other girls in the group do that. Um, and ultimately I do agree with her, but I'm going to play devil's advocate for a moment. Do either of you feel like her demanding those sort of emotions from the, uh, from the other people, do you feel like that trivializes their own healing experience? If it were to work, if it were to have worked for them. I don't think it trivializes it, but I think that it's taking the healing experience away from the person whose healing experience it belongs to. I know I, I believe, I do believe at the bottom of it, June believes that all their experiences are you know, equally terrible and horrific. Like, I, 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 I do believe that. It definitely made me a little uncomfortable, but I also... I felt frustrated for June in the next scene where Mm -hmm. that I think propelled her a lot closer to demanding of Emily. I don't even know if it's the next scene, but the scene where it's Moira and Luke and Emily and June all sitting at the table, like that was very frustrating to me. And I suppose we'll talk about that when we get to that scene. Um, But that was, I felt like they were very much trivializing June in that scene. And that is what made me start to realize that, you know, maybe all of these refugees are feeling the same way of being told to cope in ways that are not what they necessarily want. Because what jumped out at me is by the end when June 
polls the group and was basically like, well, Moira's ending it, but I'll stick around. And everyone stays. Like, that's mm-hmm. what really jumped out at me as, wow, maybe it was June that needed because she's so fresh off the trauma that she understands and because she's so poised in leading groups of women that are yeah. from Gilead. We won't call them handmaids now that they're in Canada, but she's already stepped into this role of I'm going to lead you and help you and yeah I think that's I don't know that's just more of what I saw but it did make me uncomfortable that she was very much forcing Emily to confront her face and then tried to be like well it's up to you but here she goes yeah two two things before we continue with this episode because this is pretty much where I stand throughout this whole whole back and forth with June um trying to help people in the healing capacity is that number one june when she was at i don't know i'll just call it the torture center because we don't have a name for it the torture center gilead she, guantanamo yeah gilead gilead gitmo when june was at gilead gitmo and aunt lydia and her had that face off this before the hannah thing and stuff and june really got to lay into her about how lydia failed and and how she is a horrible person and and these girls you know are are just fucked because of her like Lydia you didn't you you failed in your mission to protect them good for you Th- that is uh, like that is some of the most hurtful shit that you could possibly say to somebody and but it's the most perfect thing that you could say to somebody who is your tormentor Remember how she smiled after that, after Lydia wanted out of that room and she just looked like, like exhilarated. June knows that feeling. She wants other people to have that feeling. And I betcha that is the best that June has felt in the last several episodes, honestly. Well, and after Serena, too. Like, I think we're fresh off of that. I mean... For all we know, this could have been yesterday for June. And she's uh-huh. like, hey, support group, I got plans. Exactly. Like, those are her two bigger tor- two biggest tormentors are Serena and Aunt Lydia. And she got to say exactly what she needed to to them. And it made her feel absolutely fantastic. So I'm sure she's sitting there in this support group capacity. Like, we could just te- take the direct route. I mean, if you guys want. Like, you know, later on, we have this chick. Why not? Let's just let it out. You could... You could be wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, done with your healing process right now if you just lay into this woman and let her know how you ruined my life and make them feel so bad that they're probably going to go kill themselves. Emily did anyway with a very small sentence. But I think that's what June is envisioning is that same Mm -hmm. sort of ferocity. And the other thing, too, is that, like, in – from my experience – Lots of experience in like therapy and therapy settings uh, with myself and my and my family is that like s- there is this concept of exposure therapy. My experience with that is in an OCD capacity doing exposure therapy for OCD stuff. But I kind of look at what June ha- does in this episode as a type of exposure therapy. Mm-hmm. Um and in exposure therapy, in my experience with it, there are times where you do need to push somebody outside of their comfort zone for the sake of, of taking that step that could potentially be healing. Mm-hmm. Because doing the same thing over and over again doesn't work. You might want to try something different. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like that's what she was doing here. And so there's that side of the coin, too, is that maybe that push that she gave them that is completely different from what they've been dealing with in their group therapy is what some of those women may have needed. Yeah. I love both of those points. I want to jump back to something um, because you were talking about how euphoric it must have felt for her when she like was able to, or when June was able to unleash on Aunt Lydia and like just really lean into uh, to like, telling her captor what she thought and the same thing with serena where she was almost crazed um and it was so gratifying to watch um that sort of sense of catharsis that she undoubtedly felt when in the beginning or the very very first scene when she's cutting her hair and that should have been 
an amazing, glorious feeling for her. We saw it in the Boston Globe episode where, like, when she did cut her hair, she was just like, yes, the sense of relief shedding this, like, shedding this physical, like, um, reminder. And when we see it in the beginning of this episode, it does nothing for her in that same sort of transformative sense. Um, We've talked before about how June is, like, almost struggling with this addiction to um, to getting back at Gilead. And she's chasing that same, that same high. She's chasing that high of uh-huh. getting to like really teach these people like and show them how fucking awful they are. And like, I, I'm, I'm lacking the words, but I think you, like Scarlett, you, you made a face. You understand where I'm going. I know this. exactly what you're doing. I get yeah. it. I do. And I do. It's, it's never going to be good enough. She's always going to be chasing like that, that feeling of like really just how can she topple? How can she bring down Serena? How can she bring down Fred? How can she bring down Lydia? How can she bring down Gilead? Um, and that's like I feel like that's one of the reasons that like she's like she was really pushing for these girls to have that same sort of experience because she knows how good it can feel, but she's not also not recognizing that like it can be dangerous to continue down that path. Yeah. How do you top that rush? I mean, the fact that she got it once with Aunt Lydia is surprising. Um, The fact that she got it twice with Serena. Now I feel like she's just going to keep looking for it. And that is the trajectory that we're going to see her on. Yeah. Because she gets it a third time, too, in the courtroom scene when she gets to look at Fred and say, I am done. Mm -hmm. I am done. I understand how that could be a that could be a thing that you want to keep feeling again and again. I really do get it. I have I have had that experience once. I'd do it again. It was fucking great. I have that experience every time I'm gonna give you a movie reference, so brace yourselves. What? Every time I watch Law Abiding Citizens, it's like one of my favorite movies ever. And it's because I am so massively fueled by the idea of revenge. Like that opening scene in that movie <laughs> is the most horrific thing my mind could ever imagine, much like Handmaid's Tale. And the rest of the movie is this man seeking his own justice and all the ways in which it goes terribly wrong um and it doesn't even bother me i'm like yeah good enough he's got a goal and he's got to get to these people and he's making he's killing innocent people and i'm still like well he had a point to prove and, uh, <laughs> <Jesus Christ. laughs> like uh, honestly i can't i that movie like really really messed me up because i was like i didn't realize i was such a vengeful person and that's what i feel when i see june in all of these situations is like I, I i get why it's not a great thing for her to be chasing this and it's like i don't even logically care because it just feels so good to me i get it chasing the chasing the high of that gratification and <sighs> Yeah. I love it. Should we finish the scene? Yeah, considering. (laughs) At least I didn't talk about lights the whole time, so (laughs) we're good. Timer started at 90 minutes. Okay, so then as June and Moira are talking about uh, the healing process, Emily is being stalked by this woman that she doesn't want to have anything to do with. She just wants to talk to Emily. June is very protective of Emily. And... This woman is very insistent. She drops a piece of paper as well. Emily does not want to talk about who this woman is. Mm-hmm. She is very, very um, hesitant to say anything about her. And Emily goes. Moira follows. And this is another situation where June, again, like she takes that leadership role because she's the one that makes the woman go away. Mm-hmm. You know, she steps in in between them and Emily and she stands up for her friend. Oh, I just remembered two things I didn't say about the last scene, so. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Yeah? Knock yourself out. I don't care. What really jumped out at me before you even get to the scene where the woman shows up, where you have Moira and June talking in the bookshelves, right? And behind them, you can see where the support group was, right? There's all the chairs there and you still see the handmade lamps. And one of the things that I forgot to say about the circle of the circle of the support group with those handmade lamps, at first I said there's four and it makes a box as they're showing like the aerial view. And then as everyone's talking about June and her experience and no one's even letting her speak, like you're saying, she gets 
more and more isolated. And as the camera pans into her face, you have four more handmade lamps behind her. And now it's just June and one little handmade lamp box by herself while everyone else talks about experiences in which she can't relate. And then her first words are to tell them that she can't relate to anything they're saying. She doesn't agree with any of it. It very much set her apart and alone in her own little Gilead box. And then that same box that she was in, in this scene where the aunt and, um, with the uh, Irene and Emily show up and have this mm-hmm. interaction. The first shot you see is them walking directly into that same little like floor handmade light box. And mm-hmm. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like Emily can't get out of the box either. And now she's being confronted and she doesn't want to be there. It's very clear that this is not a confrontation she's comfortable with no. and she'd rather step away from it and not see it at all. And this woman's making it very difficult for her. And that's what I love about June is she just instantly kicks it into gear of no not here you don't even before like her security detail she's supposed to have a security detail and like you don't give a shit about this woman and emily yeah well his subject is june yeah emily yeah but i feel like this irate woman in the library should be concerning period i know agreed entirely or like anxious i don't think she was irate but she was definitely jittery and she was definitely insistent persistent Absolutely. Yeah. June put stopped her in her tracks and I thought it was so cool. 